This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today is my special guest here. We have two-time UFC tournament winner, former Valley Tudo champion of the world, former pride fighter, star of The Smashing Machine, and supposedly star of a new movie where The Rock is actually going to play him. Mark Kerr, The Smashing Machine himself, how are you doing today, sir? I'm good, man. I I definitely appreciate you having me on, and uh, I know it's taken a little bit of coordination to get us together on the on, the, you know. But I'm I'm glad that we're here, man. I, I think I'll enjoy this. You're still keeping yourself pretty busy these days. What are you, what are you doing these days? Uh, yeah, you know what? I got into right now. I'm trying to. Um, it's more of a volunteer work, you, you know, an older gentleman approached me to try to help out a Vietnam veteran friend of his. And, um, we just got, uh, Martha McSally's office involved in it. Uh, she's a local Senator here and we're trying to come up. She just got some legislation passed and, uh, she's got her plate full cause she's got reelection and stuff, but we're trying to get some stuff loaded up, uh, with her to start a, uh, Senate. Uh, inquiry into some of the veteran issues that exist in Arizona. Um, and we've helped actually rescue a couple of different veterans. It kind of, sounds kind of weird to even say rescue, but uh, we, we basically had helped a, a Vietnam veteran that was put to um, a facility that it just didn't belong in the facility. And once he gets in a situation like that, it's very hard to get him out of it. And so that's what's been occupying a lot of my time over the last couple of months here. Um, but I'm getting ready to, as COVID starts to break loose, you know, I'm going to get ready to go back to work and, you know, get back to the gym and do the things, um, you know, do some additional things, I should say. Now, I know you had an extremely successful amateur wrestling career. How did you end up getting into MMA? You, uh, that's an, a very good question. Um, so I, I moved out here in 1995, out here, Arizona, and, and, and the Sunkiss kids were putting together a training camp leading up to the 96 Olympics. And so a lot of people from a lot of parts of the country came out here to train. And it was, oh gosh, man, it was me. It was uh, all the locals, so like a guy named Melvin Douglas, uh, Townsend Saunders. Um, it was also going to be um, Kenny Monday. Uh, There's a lot of really good uh, USA wrestling guys that were out here. Zeke Jones, who's now the coach at ASU. And so I came out here, and it just so happens that the facility that we were practicing in uh, also had a dojo. And there was a gentleman there um, named Richard Hamilton, and Richard Hamilton uh, kept trying to say to us, hey, listen, if you don't make the Olympic team, you know, I think that I can get you into this fighting stuff, this UFC stuff. And that's how it just started. Um, and of that group, uh, Dan Severn uh, came out one time and we talked to him, hey, how legit is this? And, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, since he was the first wrestler uh, that was really in it and successful with it, uh, we kind of said, OK, if he dances, is OK, it's good. And then uh, Mark Coleman ended up getting in it. And then um, uh, when Mark went in it and I saw him do it, we're like, holy crap. I, you know, Mark goes, dude, you got to do it. And that was the first Valley Tudo that I did in, in, in uh, San Paulo, Brazil. And that was January, 1997. And then from there, the rest of it kind of just fell out in front of me. And there's a fan on here, John, that tipped you $5 and said, thanks for helping out us veterans Having you guys uh, care means a lot. Oh man, it's 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 the least I, it's the least I can do. You know, they just the senator just pat. If you get you know, if you get John, if you get an opportunity to look at what Martha McSally just passed, she just passed legislation here in Arizona. And I don't know if you're in Arizona or not, uh, but she she has eleven million dollars that's set aside to work on veteran homelessness. Um, and it just shouldn't exist. There isn't anybody that served in the military or in war or anything like that. It should be homeless. It should just be a rite of passage. You know, you go to war, you're in the military, you've got a house. It's not that big a deal. 
you know, we're a pretty affluent country, and I think it's the least that we could do. Um, so she set aside $11 million and some other stuff. So, you know, it, it's the least I can do, man. I appreciate that, John. And you mentioned uh, Dan Severn and Mark Coleman. Were those a couple of the fighters that you looked up to getting into MMA? You know, Mark, Mark was four years older than me, and I think Dan's a little bit older than that. Um, you know, Mark. You know, I ran into Mark when I wrestled, wrestled. So, so I had an opportunity to compete against him, and uh, you know, I was a lot younger than he was. Um, both times I competed against him, he beat me, and um, and then I did uh, training camp leading up to the um, 1992 Olympics uh, with Coleman, and that was kind of interesting because him and I were roommates. Um, and, uh, it was interesting to say the least, but uh, Mark is, Mark is, uh, Mark is actually a really good guy and I've been friends with him for a lot of years. So, you know, I looked up to him for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, not gifted with the most talent, but gifted was probably one of the hardest work ethics of, of anybody that I've ever seen. You know, he, he, he just made up for where he lacked in talent through hard work. How was Mark to spar with when you guys were training for fights? Dude, he's just, he's a stump, you know, he's just, he's, he's hard to move, you know, like I've had opportunities to train with uh, Brock Lesnar too. And Brock is like Mark plus one and a half. Um, I mean, you know, there's pictures of Brock when he's, you know, he's like six foot three and he's, you know, I'm going to say probably I've seen him 285 pounds with probably 7% body fat. You know, for a big dude, that's just unheard of, you know, and uh, Brock is just a stump, too. I mean, him and Mark are just typical Midwest wrestlers, just great at fundamentals, hard to move them off position and uh, just really difficult to train with sometimes. Did Brock bring you in to work with him during one of his training camps? He, uh, you know, Brock was smart when he first got into MMA. Um, originally, when he was trying out for the Minnesota Vikings and he was here. Uh, they had a facility uh, that that was um, really geared towards getting professional athletes either back on the field or getting them ready for like combines and stuff like that. And Brock had come out here um, when he ended his contract with the WWE and he trained. And I just happened to run into him at a local uh, MMA event that was here in uh, Phoenix. And so um, we talked for a few and I said, hey, listen, Brock, if you're ever – you know, if you're ever interested in getting an MMA, give me a call. You know, at least I can point you in the right direction. And some time went by and I got contacted by an attorney um, out of uh, Minneapolis. And um, the attorney said, hey, Brock would like to talk to you. He put us together. Brock came down here. He trained with me for a little bit. And then we went down and trained with Don Fry for a little bit. Um, just so him and I, so Don Fry and myself could evaluate Brock to say, hey, dude, you're you know, physically you have the gifts, you have all the other skills that are required. Because, you know, one thing MMA has shown is that you could be a big dude. It doesn't mean you can fight, you know. So, um, so Brock came down here. We talked a little bit. And then he had me up to Minnesota for a little bit to help him set up his training facility. I would try to get um, at least enough people around him um, and to spar with him a little bit. You know, I was past my, well past my prime to be able to spar with him like he needed. And uh, it was interesting. I spent probably almost a month up in Minnesota with him. Wow. Would, do you think uh, you would have done all right against him in an actual professional fight if you guys had been matched up together? Um, yeah. You know, any of the wrestlers, any of the wrestlers I think that I would do, I, I would do well against, um, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like, I think like if Mark Coleman and I were matched up or me and Brock Lester or Brock Lester or Mark Coleman, you know, I think for a lot of wrestlers, when you're at that level that I think you could just flip a coin some days to see who's going to win. It's just, I think it's going to, it would be that close. Um, Cause I know with Brock, there'd be a lot of wrestling, a lot of grinding. I mean, he's just a big, massive human being, you know? And so, um, you know, if you're not if you're not in great condition, he he could wear you out in half a round. You know, just how big and dominant he is physically. Mark Mark same way. Mark Coleman was a grinder. 
just the grinder get on top of you and grind you into the ground. So any of those guys, I know that I'm just as good a wrestler, if not a better wrestler in some aspects. Um, so flip a coin, I think that's the way most of that would be with either Brock, myself, or, or Coleman. Did you happen to catch the heavyweight fight last night with Steve I, I just I read some I read some of it. I missed it last night. So um, did, obviously you watched it. I've only seen the highlights. Yeah, uh, but yeah, Steve saying why not? Obvious by decision. Yeah, Steve was he's a good he's a tough kid, man. Any of those Eastern European kids, man, are just tough kids, man. They they really are. Um, a friend of mine who's a photographer here, a guy named Tony Mandridge, a guy named Tony Mandridge, had taken some pictures of him and stuff like that. And I know Coleman has helped him out before. Um, and the guy is just the guy's got talent, man. He's he's a he's a tough kid. We've heard that Daniel Cormier might go into professional wrestling now that he's retired. I know you did a small bit of pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. Do you think Cormier could do well if he crossed over? Yeah, because I, I think that he would get the performance part of it. You know, like, um, you know, obviously when you're fighting, you're fighting. You're fighting to win. So sometimes if you're doing a lot of ground and pound, it's not, you know, people that appreciate the sport uh, understand that that's a huge part of the sport. Um, but people that don't understand the sport are, are looking at MMA, I'm talking about, and watch somebody do some ground and pound, they're like, oh, this is boring. You know, but somebody that understands sport going, oh, my God, look at the control on him. He won't let the dude up. Oh, look at him. He's just bad. You know, and so I think Daniel would get the part where it's entertainment. When I did it, I totally uh, – the guy's dead now. He's a Japanese guy named Hajimoto. And Hajimoto, when he struck out and did his own gig, it was fun. It was actually fun. In and, and, and Japanese pro wrestling, they lay it in as hard as you can imagine. I mean, they lay it in as hard as you can, and you know it's almost up to your to protect yourself, you know. And, and I know American pro wrestling is a little bit different how they lay it in and how they, you know, do all their stuff. But in Japan, they still this is really funny. In Japan, they still really think like they're pro wrestlers to get in the ring with, uh, you know, with with a Dan, with a DC and fight with them and be, you know, and it's oh, our pro wrestler guy is going to win. It's like, no, he would get the crap kicked out of him. So in Japan, in Japan they still hold on to that uh, belief that their pro wrestlers are tough guys. I heard that you got a massive payday for that pro wrestling match you did. The con we're talking about the contract that I signed. Yeah. That's when so you cut the, out. So, yeah, the contract that I signed for somebody going from MMA over to professional wrestling, um, it just wasn't – it just – I mean, you would end up with – Anywhere from probably a five thousand to probably seventy five hundred dollar a night guarantee, and they'd probably do, you know, a you know, you know, five to probably eight fight guarantee, depend or not fight, but performance guarantee, and it just happens where um, everything just kind of fell into place. It was actually really fun. It was really fun to do, and you know, if Hajimoto kept the the you know the event going more i probably would have ended up renewing a contract but you know he ended up getting sick and then ended up dying of a heart attack actually did wwe ever make you an offer um uh you know what's really funny rick rick brought me out to california to try to train me and a bunch of guys when he had his um oh god what did he call that he called it like university something basically where you went out there and you trained in pro wrestling. He had those small little shows on the weekend where you kind of honed your skills, got your routine and stuff. So Rick had presented it. I had been to a couple different uh, WWE shows and talked to uh, Shane McMahon. And I talked to a couple of the other guys and they're basically like, if you don't have your head screwed on straight, if you get in this and you don't have your head screwed on straight, the industry will just mow you down. You, you just be a number and a statistic, you know, and that was basically it from everybody that I talked to was like, dude, if you're going to make the transition, you have to have things buttoned up. You need to be ready to work. Um, they're on the road a ton 
You know, I think he said uh, your first year you'd be on the road 300 days. You know, I'd be like, oh, my God, that's like a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, you know, it's it's and I didn't feel at the time that I could make that kind of commitment. So, you know, like anybody that's an A type personality, if you're not if you don't think you can be the best at it, it's like, OK, I'm doing really good with fighting right now. I'm going to stick with that and then see what course that runs and. You know, if there's an opportunity for me to do pro wrestling in the future, I'll let that be. You have a fan named Rodney here that tipped you $20. He says, thanks for your exciting performances in your prime. He asks, why did you keep fighting after the Tar Tarov loss? Why didn't you retire then? Why did you leave the UFC and pride after UFC 15? Oh, boy, that's a lot of unpacking there. So um, I should have retired, and, and there really isn't a, a good answer um, to why. You know, I would have retired with, with a decent record in CAC. I would have been, pro I think it was like 12 or 13 and 3, and I would have retired and been fine. Um, I think at that time when I had sat out long enough, uh, it was a two-year two, two and a half year time frame where I sat out from that last fight. Um, and the industry had grown a ton. So there was a lot of regional promoters that were offering just st stupid money. I mean, my first fight back, I ended up fighting in the IFL and they ended up paying me uh, like $75,000. And I had been out of the ring for two and a half years. And it was the same thing with a lot of the other promotions. Um, to be honest with my fans and to be honest with myself, I have to actually say that, you know, as a competitor, it sucked because I had to eat a lot of my pride just fighting for money. It's something I said I would never do. Um, but, you know, when you get to a point where it's like I had a young child um, and, you know, my body was broken down and I still needed to make money. So a lot of the fights that I took that I should not have taken because the money was uh, too tempting to turn down. Um, mm -hmm. So that that much I regret. I mean, that's just being honest uh, with myself and with my fans that um, if I could take some of those fights back and rewind the clock, I would, but I can't, obviously. Um, and, you know, some of the other things, uh, what was the other, what was there? That's the first part. What's the second part? Uh, let me just go to back to it for a second. The second part was why did you leave the UFC for pride after UFC 15? Okay. So that was money as well. And it was money and opportunity. It was money and opportunity. Um, and I'll, I'll look, give you a look, long, short answer for it. So uh, it was still owned by Bob Meyerowitz um, and Bob Meyerowitz was not paying any money. It was only legal in four States. Um, and you just couldn't make any money doing it. They, they were offering me, uh, you know, they went from $25,000 for, for the tournament fights uh, to $50,000 for a single fight. And then Pride got involved and Pride had offered me $145,000 and they offered for me to fight against Hoist Gracie. So it was opportunity and it was money. And then it's, it's just kind of ironic when the UFC was sold by Bob Meyerowitz to Frank and Lorenzo Fertitta, they had offered me one, one time they offered me a fight and it was against Pete Williams. And I was still under contract with pride. They offered to pay me $25,000 to fight Pete Williams. And at the time I was getting paid, you know, six figures from the Japanese. And it was like, okay, I'm going to take a chance to fight for the UFC to fight Pete Williams for nickels, or I can stay with pride. So I just continue to fight with pride. When you were fighting with pride, did you ever have much dealings with the Japanese mafia? I know for wrestling, they sponsor mm -hmm. a lot of wrestlers and there's some stories from wrestlers about them. Oh, it's, it's, it's pervasive. I mean, it's um, uh, the guy that I dealt with was a guy named Mr. Ishijaka. Uh, Mr. Ishijaka was Korean. That was um, 
the name he used in Japan, he is his legal name is Kim Kim Duck Su was his legal name. And um it was there. Mr. Ishii was the guy that that did K1. So it was Mr. Ishii and Mr. Ishijaka. Um it was all over the place. It really was. Nobody talked about it. Um, the only time that has really that it was really brought to a significant emphasis to me is when they had a K1 event in Las Vegas, and um, a gal named Yokino, who was a vice president of uh, Dream Stage, uh, which they, they were the operating arm of Pride. Uh, came to me and I was not allowed to take any public pictures with Rishi Shaka. I wasn't allowed to be at the same gaming tables with him. I wasn't allowed to participate on any level. I wasn't allowed to have dinner with him. I wasn't allowed to be seen with him. I wasn't allowed to do anything because in Japan, I could actually do those things. I could go out to dinner with him. I can go out for entertainment. You know, I could go out, you know, in different participate like that because nobody would take a picture of him there um you know but if they had a japanese american uh reporters i think that they were afraid that they would snap pictures and it just would break into a scandal that didn't need to be you have a guy named todd that tipped you five dollars thanks a lot todd and a few fans were asking on here you had such a huge neck in your prime is there anything specific you did for your neck routine to get that Oh man, you know, you know what we like, literally it was, it was like sit-ups, right? So at the end of every practice, almost everybody in a gym, you're going to watch in an MMA gym, they do sit-ups at the end of every practice. We would do two things. Like I did a, a ton of shrugs because uh, it just builds the base of your neck up. So once your traps get laid down at the base of your neck, you can build a bigger neck on top of it. And then it was just all the different and neck. Um, we would do a harness on our necks and we do a lot of different things like that. Even some of the cable pool machines have a harness that you can put on and you would do that. And then you do these exercises where you just do isometrics and you'd actually do have somebody pulled out on your neck with a towel and you do this and just fight it back and forth through a whole range of motions, side to side, side to side, side to side, back and forth, back and forth, a ton of isometrics. Um, it was traps to build the base and then you do some weighted stuff. And, uh, once your neck got, got started getting bigger, it's just one of those things that all of a sudden I like, you know, it's like, I look in the mirror and it's like, holy crap, I got a 25 and a half inch neck, you know? So, um, it, it, it was interesting because it felt like I could, it felt like I could just stiffen up my, stiffen up my neck and I could use it as a battering ram if I need to. <laughs> Now, what would you consider the toughest fight of your career to be? You've had a lot of tough fights over the years. You know, the, the first fights, just because of the uncertainty of them. Um, you know, Paul Varland's, I had no idea what, what, what was going to happen in that fight as far as what he was capable of. Um, film study wasn't as big as it is now because there's such a huge sample size of a video that you can watch guys that you're going to fight against. Um, and I knew nothing about Fabio Vigel. Um, it was just said to me, hey, dude, listen, these, these Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys, they're, they're like, you know, they do stuff that you just can't pick up until you're caught in. And I was like, oh, that's great. You know, so there's nothing I can study on film or anything. And they're like, nope. Um, that was probably the, the toughest is to get through those first series of fights. And then a guy that just for whatever reason I had tough competition with was Igor World Champion. Um, just typical Eastern European, um, just a grinder. You know, Igor was the type of guy that literally you'd have to beat him to death to get him to quit. Um, and you knew it was always going to be a tough fight. So that was probably one of my tougher ones. Would you ever consider being an MMA coach with all your experience and knowledge? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's the two things like after this past, um, uh, my son, who's 15 years old, he wrestles for his high school, uh, here in Arizona. And, um, I just, his coach, I under, you know, I'll, I'll concede his coach is a full-time teacher, has a family and then picks up 
coaching because it gives them a little extra spread of money during, during the year. And so um, after watching his coach and how um, there's no way to be kind about it, how just uneducated he was about wrestling and just the philosophy of it and how to teach kids, you know, the fundamentals of wrestling and stuff like that, that, that last year that got my blood boiling to the point where I'm like, I'll just apply for the wrestling coaching job. And then if I apply for the wrestling coaching job, well, the next succession of it is it, I'll have some time. So I'll be able to actually get into MMA coaching. And, you know, it's something I want to do. Uh, my body's healed up a little bit over the last year. Um, and so I think that it's physically I'm capable of doing something that I wasn't able to do even, you know, even four months ago, um, let alone, you know, five years ago. Todd tipped you another $5, and he has a follow-up question for your neck. How often did you actually work your neck? You know, Todd, I would do it, you know, at the end of every other practice. So even if you're in the gym, even if you're in the gym five days of the week, I would do neck three days of the week. In the first month, you're going to do it. It's just it sucks because there's, there's nothing – worse than when your neck is sore because it's muscles that you normally don't train. Um, and when they get sore, sometimes it can be uncomfortable. Um, and so that first month you just be prepared to like, Hey, I'm going to have to double up on my motion or, you know, I'm going to take a, you know, hot compress or have to rub, you know, uh, you know, some kind of, you know, hot and icy on my neck to make it feel better. So at least three out of, if you're doing five practice, at least three of the practices you can do in your neck. Um, and like I said, once you start to build strength in it, then you can add different isometric drills in it. Like it got to a point where they couldn't hold a towel anymore for my neck, where I'd have to get a lighter training partner, but I'd have them hang on my neck, hang on the back of my neck. And I'd just do like, almost like you're doing pull-ups with a person on my neck. Um, and obviously it could be with someone like Rico or some of the bigger guys. Cause it, it just, I wasn't capable of doing that, but having your training partner hold a towel when you're just moving the towel up and down and he's yanking down on as hard as he can. So there's different ways to up the ante, um, with using live partners, uh, using different, uh, you can use bands on it too. Uh, but some of that stuff I would at least do three days a week. You mentioned Rico. Do you think he achieved his full potential as a fighter? No. And I hate to say it because, I mean, you, you're, you, you're, you're a UFC champion. That's a world champion. You're, that's a pretty high pinnacle. But I, I thought, me personally, um, I thought they could have beat Tim to defend it for his first defense. Um, and I thought that he could have. I thought he could have had just an incredible run um, holding on to that belt for a long time. Um, he's probably one of the most talented kids. He's got a great jujitsu game. Uh, he's, he's worked so hard and diligently on his hands. Um, you know, talent wise, I think he was one of the best talent guys. You know, I know that his weight fluctuated through the years and stuff like that, but that, that hasn't been an issue in years and years and years. Um, I think he could have had probably five or six or more uh, title defenses for the belt. And Phil tips you $5, and he says, did you ever fight anyone in the late 90s that you felt was stronger than you? Oh. Um, you know, I thought Daniel Bobish would be just because of his build. Um, he's just a big freaking dude, man. I mean, Bobish, when I look at him, I go, oh crap, this might be one of those things where you're like, you look at a power lifter and a power lifter is not very defined muscular wise until you grab a hold of him. And he just has a dense, dense, dense pack of muscles. Um, and I thought Bobish would be, and Bobish was strong. Uh, just in some areas I was stronger, especially when you, when I took him off his feet. He just wasn't as strong. I mean, most of the guys that lift heavy like he does are more linear strong, not angles and stuff like that. Um, so Bobby should probably be the closest one. And Rodney tips you $5, and he says, you mentioned you were offered a fight against Pete Williams by UFC. How do you think you would have fared against him if the fight happened? 
Oh, I know, <laughs> I know Mark Coleman would have made, made for sure that I would have been ready for it. Um, I think I would have done, I think I would have done good against Pete. Uh, he was really good striking skills, um, had average ground skills. Um, and at the time that I was fighting, when I was off with the fight, I still was just so heavy ground and pound that, you know, anybody in, in you know what, in pride, you weren't allowed to elbow. Um, and in the UFC, you're allowed to elbow. So that would have been just a huge weapon that would open back up. And if you got me on top of somebody and gave me elbows, I, I just don't think they'd last very long. Sammy Boy tips you nine ninety nine and says, "Who gave you the nickname of the Smashing Machine?" I just went. I just went through this. So um, the Brazilians did. Um, there is a article in. It's not Gracie magazine. Um, it's called I think Otaname, Otaname or. Oh gosh, man! I'll have to actually uh, pull it up for my sake, but. It's, I believe, and I'm butchering this in Portuguese, but it's like Makina Debater, the machine that smashes. And so after I fought Fabio Gugel and what I did with him over a 15 or, you know, I forgot how long it was, 15 or 20 minute fight. Um, they watched me take one of the guys that, at, I think at the time he might have been a two or three time Brazilian national champion in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and just manhandle him. And so, like, oh my God, the the McKinney debater, the the smack, the machine that smashes, the smashing machine. And John wants to know if you ever amateur wrestled Kurt Angle. Yeah, I actually amateur wrestled him for God. Um, so Kurt was a heavyweight in college. Even though that size wise, Kurt is a little bit smaller than I am. Um, and in college, I was bigger and cut down to 190 pounds. So in college, I never wrestled against Kurt. But I wrestled against him in 1992, 93, 94, 95. And so at one point, I was up where Kurt didn't beat me in those years. Kurt didn't beat me until 1995 when we, when we wrestled and the – Freestyle Nationals. Uh, we we had tied at the Freestyle Nationals. I believe it was two two or one one, um, and he beat me on passivity calls. And then then six weeks after that, you have the World Team Trials, and I wrestled Kurt again there, and um, and he beat me. You you wrestle to make it as the number one uh, guy for the world. Um, you have to wrestle uh, the best out of three matches. And so Kurt beat me um, two matches out of three. And again, it was like 2-2. Two, two, uh, and 2-2, two, 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 we tied. 1-1, uh, one, one, we tied. But he beat me both times on passivity calls. So our record actually stands where I have four, four wins. Let's see. One, two, three, four. No, I think we're three and three. I think I beat him three times and he's beat me three times. How would he have fared in an MMA fight against you? Oh, I would have killed him. <laughs> <laughs> he, just, he just, you know, the thing that Kurt, Kurt is so fast. I mean, like unbelievably quick. I mean, like, like when you're wrestling against him, there's a match that's coming up. Kurt has a uh, doc, a documentary that's coming up. And in, 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 in that documentary, there's a little bit about me and him and our, our competitions against each other. And so the 1994 uh, uh, Freestyle Nationals, or uh, anyways, we wrestled against each other. He just, he wasn't big enough. He wasn't strong enough. And I was just a bigger, stronger, 220 pound wrestler so I can fend off his attacks. And number one counter for speed in wrestling is strength. And so I was just bigger and stronger. He can get in and attack me. He just couldn't finish it because he wasn't strong enough. And though, and then in 1995, he got in. So in the years he would he would end up fighting me in the you know at the early part of my MMA career. I was big. It was just I would I would have destroyed him. Sorry, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> And you were uh, portrayed in the movie Foxcatcher. Did you see that? And how did you think of the way they portrayed you? 
Um, it, it's interesting because I, I I didn't come into I, I didn't come into Foxcatcher until until basically almost a whole entire house of cards had fallen down. Um, for the nineteen ninety three world team trials, John DuPont watched me wrestle and he had some weird things like he preferred wrestlers that were born in certain months. And I was a Sagittarius. He preferred Sagittarius wrestlers. It was just one of his little giddy ups. Um, so 1993, um, I signed with Foxcatcher and then three years later in January, uh, Dave was murdered by John. So I wasn't there for that long. Um, it just was a weird, it was a weird giddy up and everybody kind of just turned a blind eye towards it because, you know, as wrestlers, we know that every dollar counts. Uh, so if someone's giving you 1200 bucks or 1500 bucks a month, that covers so much of what you need money for, uh, when you're trading. And, um, you know, I just think that, um, you know, portrayed things relatively accurate. Uh, cause there's enough people that were around that scene and had enough input and gave a clear enough perspective of really what was going on, um, to give a pretty accurate portrayal of it. Um, it's just interesting. Cause I, I look back on it and still, I still get sad, you know, about Dave and, um, you know, he was, he was, he was my coach and, and I didn't go to the funeral you know, I regret that a little bit, but John's estate was paying for the airfare to go to the funeral, and I felt weird about that. And I figured I would just skip it and mourn it my own way. You know, so there's some stuff that I could have done better uh, for me emotionally, and uh, and so it's his history books will tell that story over again. Double S tips you five dollars and says, "Can you address the rumors?" that there were fixed fights in pride? Um, you know, I've, I've spoke about this before and, you know, I, I would be an idiot if I said uh, there wasn't fixed fights in pride. I would be in a fool uh, to think that um, there was that much mafia presence around and there wasn't um, some kind of concessions that fighters had to make, you know, I don't think that any fighter in the right mind would, um, you know, voluntarily go and seek out, you know, Hey, I want to throw the fight or would you throw the fight for me? You know, I think any of that, that went on was influenced by, you know, some kind of angle, the mob was, you know, that had, you know, certain, you know, betting lines that they needed changed or whatever. I mean, there's so much, nefarious uh things that would go on there culturally uh that i didn't understand um so i would say i'd be an idiot like i like i said um but in order for me to say anybody had one fight fixed or not fixed and didn't fixed and all this i just i i don't know me personally i never threw a fight and i had them come to me and kind of say it in a roundabout way. And I just had no interest in um, my integrity and my principles or anything that I was going to present to the public that I felt like, uh, you know, long-term wise, even if they gave me 250,000 and uh, okay, I spend that, I still got my pride to deal with. I'm going to have my pride for the rest of my life. You know, I'm going to have my integrity you know, so I thought that that was more important to me than any kind of monetary compensation. Now, Rick Bassman has actually told this story to me on here about Mark Coleman taking the 60 grand for his his dive in that one pride fight. Were you surprised that Mark did that or was it just a situation where it was good money for him, you think? No, oh, it wasn't money. It was op it was opportunity. Um, they, you know what they ended up doing? And I don't think Rick realizes this. They held Mark's participation in the Grand Prix event 
over his head if he didn't take what they were offering. So if you think about it, Mark had lost like three or four fights before the Takata fight. And um, the only way they were going to allow Mark to move forward was to say, hey, we're going to match up with Takata. Good news. You, you, we'll get you into pride. And um, bad news, you, 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 you're going to lose. You know, and I think I just I, I don't think if there would have been another way, I know that Mark would have took the other way. <clears throat> but if he didn't, if he didn't agree to. My understanding is, is that if he didn't agree to. Take a dive with Takata that he would not have been allowed to participate in the Grand Prix and that his fighting days would have been over. So you look at it from his perspective, uh, father, young, two young kids, two young girls, and the UFC was closed to him at that point. And so <clears throat> the only thing that he has is, is he's got to try pride. So I, I honestly can't fault him, you know, and presented with similar circumstances. I can't say that I would have done any different. Um, I know that he had a lot on his plate. Um, I know he regrets it. I know it's a huge regret of his. And I think that he stated that publicly, um, that it's just something where <clears throat> I just know, I, I've known Mark for 20, God, man, I've known him since 1992. I've known him for, for 30 years, you know, and we come from the same general area in Ohio. It's just, I know that, I know that if there was a different, way to do it i know that he would have did it a different way and i know he regrets it the rmm tips you two dollars and says how often do you lift these days you still look great <laughs> um i'm just starting back um i just got the okay from my doctor um to um to go forward with with starting at least get in the gym to kind of figure out what i can and can't do um, I came down with, with uh, neuropathy, which is in both my legs. Um, oh, God, man, it's uh, almost four years ago now. And I got treatment um, earlier in the year um, here locally from, from a doctor. American Physical Medicine is uh, the name of his facility. And he treated me with stem cells. And it's actually worked surprisingly well. Um, you know, it's almost like if somebody selling like an elixir, you know, drink this and you'll be, you know, have a full head of hair and you'll be seven foot tall in the morning. You know, you think, oh, my God, there's no way. And it's the same thing with stem cells, all the reading, all the research, everything that I've done on them. And, and uh, the doc, uh, Dr. Vin um, at American Physical Medicine, uh, it's incredible, man. It, re it really has. I've got a lot of uh, a nerve regrowth in my feet and stuff. So I'm excited to get back in the gym once we get the okay from the governor here in Arizona. So um, hopefully I'll be back in the gym and look a little bit better. Phil tips you $5 and says, were you ever close to fighting Ken Shamrock, Dan Severn, or Don Fry? Um, uh, you know, it's interesting, probably all three of them at one point. Um, I know that Ken was a, uh, conversation topic, uh, with some of the, uh, matchmakers for pride. Um, Ken was looking for work at the time and kind of was stuck in no man's land where he was like, oh, you're going to be a pro wrestler. You're going to get back to fighting. So I know Ken's name came up, uh, Don Fry fought, um, uh, Don Fry was another one that came up and, um, Dan Severn, it never really came up seriously because Dan, Dan was a little bit past. Um, Dan was a little bit past his prime. Um, I know Dan fought for a long time, um, and so uh, the two serious ones were Ken, and uh, we're also going to be uh, Don Fry. We could do a whole podcast on your amateur wrestling career, but could you briefly sum up your your career at Ohio State and winning the NCAA's? So, um, oh gosh, man. So, uh, you know what? <laughs> so at Syracuse University, 
Devin. So sorry about that. Coleman's Ohio State. Kevin Random went to Ohio State. I'm serious. Oh, sorry. So I won a national. I no, you're Mark good. Coleman. Oh, 100%. So Mark, so I'll, I'll pump the brakes here. Mark Coleman, his senior year in college was my freshman year in college. And on the way to winning his national championship, I wrestled Mark Coleman first round, first match of his run to an NCAA title. Um, me, my senior year is when I won an NCAA championship. And the first, um, oh God, it was crazy because the first two well, the first three years, I didn't even win a match at the NCAA tournament. It took me all the way to my senior year to put together a run uh, mo- mentally. It was all mental. Um, it took me to my senior year. And w- once that barrier was broken, it, it opened up a whole new level of wrestling that, that I had never experienced. It was just like I could you know, tap into a part of my brain and, and just function on a subconscious level with wrestling. So my senior year, I ended up wrestling Randy Couture in the finals of the NCAA tournament. And I beat Randy uh, 12 to four. Um, he had taken second two years in a row and wrestled. He, Randy wrestled for Oklahoma State. So it's just kind of one of those ironic things that you tie Randy Couture, myself, Mark Coleman, and Kevin Randleman all together um, which is a pretty interesting a lot. What do you think about Syracuse no longer having a wrestling program? I don't think they do anymore. No, they don't. They don't. It, I think it's tragic. Um, you know, like anybody that's heard me talk about wrestling, the, the thing that I like about wrestling is, you know, all the individual stuff, obviously, you know, it's Imano Imano. It's, you against another person. It's more of your mind's dueling than it is your physical self. But very few sports offer the opportunity for some kid that's 115 pounds where you can compete at a world championship level or an Olympic level. Um, And that's the beauty about wrestling is it includes such a diverse bunch of kids so there's no other sport. Ask a 115-pound kid if he wants to go out for the varsity football team. They tell you, hell no, you know. And so that that's the thing about wrestling, which which I like. And for them to exclude it, um, it, it's just a matter of time before they start trying to go after all these smaller Division One sports uh, to try to get them where they just don't exist. And it, it'll be a, it'll be a sad day when that happens. Did you ever have any talk about fighting Tank Abbott over the years? He's done a few interviews <laughs> with us on this channel. Yeah, you know, I, I I don't think, again, it's one of those where I don't think it was that serious with Tank. Um, but, uh, you know, he would have been another good one. You know, he's just, he's, he's, he's atypical early UFC participant where you don't, you just didn't know. It was like, hey, dude, you know, I think he's tough and you put him in there and he actually punches like a mule, you know, and it's just kind of interesting because at the early days of the UFC, they, they just didn't know what was going to be successful in that ring. There's a fan asking here if you ever saw any backstage fights at an MMA event. Um, with corners, I have. And with promoters and stuff, but with fighters, no, there might there might have been some mouthing off and stuff, but nine out of ten times, fighters were going to settle into the ring and they were going to leave it in the ring. Um, there's still enough respect in the sport where, you know, unless you're doing something stupid where you're doing like a, a Conor McGregor and you're taking it to a level it should never be. I'm um, talking about someone's religion or family or stuff like that. You know, that's when it can get ugly. But if you're, if you're just talking about the individual, I'm going to whip your ass. I'm tougher than you. I'm better than you know, and ask for your mom, you know, that's no big deal. You know, but if you're taking it to a different level in the back, you're going to get in a fight. When I was doing it, there weren't any Cardinal McGregor's. I mean, it was just guys that were taking it in the ring. They were leaving it in the ring and that was it. 
Who punched the hardest of all the guys that you fought? Oh, fuck. Oh, God, man. Um, God, Volchanji punched hard. Um, God, why can't I think of his name? Um, I'll, th- I'll think, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to this question. So I'm trying to think right now. Uh, well, Volchanji it- punched pretty hard. Um, and there was, um, I'll, I'll circle back to the question. <laughs> I'll give you an easy question. How did this whole situation with the rock come about where he is apparently going to tell your story in a movie and actually play the role of you? Um, just strange, strange. So I'll, I'll wind the clock back. Um, a lot of years. So I lived in Santa Monica for three years. Uh, when I was living there, uh, The Rock uh, started in MMA or started in pro wrestling in 1996. I started in uh, MMA in 1997. So two years later, so three years later, I moved out to California. Uh, uh, the Rock was still living there. And I happened to run into him uh, like 1999 when he trained at Gold's Gym. And um, we just had brief, brief, brief conversation. Um, and that's it. And then my documentary comes out a couple years later. He had the opportunity to look at the documentary. And I ran into him again at Venice. And him and I had a longer conversation. And he said, hey, do you want to grab lunch? And I said, yeah. And so we go and we have lunch and we exchange numbers and stuff like that. And then life happens. And, you know, he goes on to do his pro wrestling stuff. And I go on to do my MMA stuff and all these different aspects of it. So um, a lot of time goes by. And so this is from what he told me and what his agent told me. Uh, So recently, um, last year, he says he wakes up in the middle of the night. And he has an idea and he goes down on his computer. He pulls up the smashing machine movie. He watches that. He watches all these other things he can find on the internet. He wakes his manager up at like four o'clock in the morning and he goes, I found my next project. Um, I want to put this together where I'm going to do a movie about Mark Kerr. And so at that point, you know, this is last year. So I'm not really on social media ton. He tracks down uh, Brad Schlater, his, his agent, tracks down uh, my uh, ex-wife, Dawn. Dawn gets a hold of me. I call out to Brad and Brad shares that story with me. Hey, he was in the middle of the night, sleeping like her, sleeping, gets up, says, this is what I want to do. And, you know, so, so Brad Schlater goes about acquiring all the rights. So I had originally sold the movie rights and I had sold some other rights that are associated with the movie um, to a production company and it ends up being where a gentleman, an Israeli gentleman ended up buying um, my life rights and my movie rights and some other rights. I didn't know there were so many rights to the to a documentary and so uh, The Rock buys them all and uh, then him and I talked right before he made the announcement at Madison Square Garden And, uh, you know, he's basically said, hey, you know, when we had spoke, you know, years back, I wanted to do a project like this. um, And I didn't have any juice. I didn't have any pull. He goes, now I have the ability. I have pull. I can get this done. And um, so he goes, just hang tight. I'm going to make some announcements on on Instagram and we're going to put this thing together and uh, it'll be fantastic. You're going to have a blast doing it and uh, we'll bring you on as a consultant and um, you know, we'll just put this together to make it fun and it'll be something that I think that the public will enjoy. And so it's just kind of one of those weird things where, you know, him watching the documentary years and years and years ago and having that kind of planted in his mind um, you know, it just popped in his mind again. He's like, oh shit, I can get this done. And, uh, probably one of the coolest, you know, I know everybody says this, but probably one of the most gracious, coolest dudes. I mean, he, he had said to me, he goes, 
you know, hey, Mark, I just want you to know this is an honor for me to do this, for, for me to take this on and put everything I have behind it to make it the best possible uh, production and movie that I can. And, and you know, it, it's just something that I really think that I can do a great job with. And, you know, everybody involved, I think, will be happy with the, the, the product, you know, at, at the end of the day. So, um, you know, then obviously COVID hits and all this stuff hit. So, you know, things are still moving forward. Um, I think once uh, COVID kind of breaks loose, they're going to make an announcement for the writer and the director. Um, and once the writer and director, they'll have a distribution studio uh, lined up for it. It's just, it's, it's, it's going to be fun moving forward. It's something that I didn't anticipate. I didn't, you know, and, and part of what, um, part of what I've come to understand is that you can, there's plenty of other people in MMA that he could tell Conor McGregor's story or he can tell, you know, Mark Coleman's story or Boss Rutan's story or Randall, you know, Kevin Randleman, or he can tell so many different stories of people. Um, and he, he kind of looks at, you know, what, what my life was. And it's just the, it's the struggle that you go through. It's the different stuff that you go through as an individual. So it's really not about the wins, the losses, the championships, because there's been a ton of people that have won way more than I have and had a lot, you know, more entertaining fights than I have. You know, I think it comes down to um, him being able to tell a story that he believes will come across to as many people as, you know, you just, you, you deal with stuff. You have ups and you have downs. You have days where you get your, your dick knocked in the dirt and you just you get back up and you do the best you can the next day. And, you know, I think for whatever reason, a lot of that resonates with him. And, you know, he know I think at this point, the success he has, I think he knows what, resonates with the general public and um you know he wouldn't take on something that he doesn't you know that he doesn't think that he can make the absolute best he possibly can it's just it's not his style so i'm excited and i hope that that one will benefit you financially as well did the smashing machine uh, i know it was a documentary i assume you probably didn't make a fortune off of that one no no, and, and, you know, part of what uh, Brad had said to me and also what um, what The Rock had said, you know, just simply, you know, without much detail, you know, in part, him taking this on is to benefit you uh, financially, is to make a difference in where you are in your life and where your life can be moving forward. So, you know, I know that um, it is part of why he's doing it i know that um you know it just seems lately it, everything he touches just seems to do really really well so i mean it's incredible and for your best lifts in the gym could you tell us for instance your squat bench press and deadlift oh god man i didn't have that big a you know my my squat was uh, I just went through this with my son. I could squat just a little bit over 700 pounds. And that was being honest. That's being an honest squat. That's not, I mean, that's being legit, honest squat. Um, you know, my deadlift was about, God, my deadlift was a little bit more than that. My deadlift was probably seven, I think I did 755 or seven, God, 755. Uh, 705, 755, um, squat, deadlift, and uh, bench press. Squat, deadlift, and bench. Yeah. My bench, my bench was uh, 435. My best on that. Okay. I'm so 435, 500. No, you know what, man? I here's the whack part about it. I my I have long arms, right? Yeah. And that's a shit ton of distance to travel, man, to move 500 pounds. I even tried moving my grip way out. But once I got to a certain point, I just lost strength. So there's like the optimal grip on your bench where, where I'm not in too tight because that cuts my strength too. Not out too far because that cuts my strength. Here's my optimal, optimal, optimal pushing range. But it still was a long distance to go to move yeah. any kind of weight. You know, so 
it's something actually I wanted to, and I don't think it's in my future just to have a 500 pound bench. Uh, something I wanted to, but I got man, I had such strong legs. My legs were just legit, man. But I Luke, did squats. Go figure. Yeah. Luke tipped you nine ninety nine. He says he's been a fan of you since the Pride days, and he hopes you're doing well. I appreciate that, buddy. And just, you know, for everybody that's tuned into this, man, just thank Gavin for, for reaching out. Um, I, I appreciate it, man. I, I really do because a lot of this is stuff I really like doing. I don't mind answering people's questions, uh, fans' questions, not fans' questions. And I try to be as uh, forthright and as honest as possible as I, I can. I got nothing to hide at this point. I mean, the gig's up, right? Um, and so um, I just appreciate all the fans and you know, I'll be having some stuff coming up here um, and some stuff released on Instagram and I'm going to start to get more active on it once this COVID stuff breaks loose. So I'm going to try to get some lifting tips. Like once a week, I'll have like some lifting tips and just, you know, like, um, you know, smashing machine secret lifting stuff or, you know, whatever it is, just stuff that I used to do and stuff that I used to do wasn't that complicated. It wasn't that complex um, because the simpler I kept my training, the less likely it was that I was going to get injured. So a lot of it's just basic stuff, man. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to start doing something like that in the next couple of months. Um, so some of the stuff you'll be able to post comments and questions on Instagram. I'll be able to answer it for some. If I have enough time, I'll be able to do little videos where you'll be able to see some of the stuff what I did, you know, usually this, this, and this, and this. So, um, hopefully, hopefully, hang on, hopefully it will be in the next couple of months, okay? What is your Instagram so people can look it up and add you? Say that again? What is your actual Instagram account under for people that want to find it on it's Instagram? It's Mark Kerr TSM. Okay. So it's Mark Kerr, the smashing machine. Um, and I got knocked out of here when this call came in. So just give me one second to plug back in. Okay. Uh, shoot. I'm afraid we're almost to the end here. So can you still yeah, hear we're, me? We're, yeah, we're wrapping up. Um, I hope that we can actually have you back on again, though, maybe in a few weeks and do this again. Uh, because okay. there's a lot of questions, but I know you're a busy man. Hey, Devin, I appreciate it, man. Thank everybody for coming on. I'll stay in touch. Uh, stay in touch with me. Kind of as this, uh, you know, like I said, when this unfolds, man, uh, you know, you and I will spend uh, time on it. Tips only is fine. You know, stuff like that. I mean, appreciate everybody that tip. Believe me or not, as stuff has come down with COVID, five bucks sometimes makes a difference. So I appreciate everybody just reaching out and uh, their questions. So um, there'll be another opportunity coming up in the next month. Excellent. And the last thing I'll ask you about to close this off, we have the big fight between Tyson and Roy Jones Jr. coming up in November. Any prediction? Oh, Tyson. I mean, Tyson still looks like a god, man. I mean, I've watched him train here in Phoenix in person and just – uh, like I can't define, I can't define or adequately describe the sound his punches make on a water punching bag. I can't describe it. It's the only kind of sound that when you hear it in person, you go, holy crap. Just like when you look, you know, when you're at a ballpark and you hear somebody hit a baseball with a wooden bat out of the ballpark, there's no other sound like that. So there's, it, it's incredible. I mean, I would take Tyson day in, day out, month in, month out. Any I just hope he doesn't fight. kill Roy Jones. <laughs> I actually almost fought Roy Jones a few years ago, but the Arizona Boxing Commission wouldn't sanction it. He had an open challenge. I wanted to have it, whether I would win or not, but they wouldn't <laughs> Dude, that would have been That would have been great. That would have been fantastic, man. Oh, my God. Oh, so do, you have, uh, do you have anything you want to close up with? I know you got to get going, but any final comments for the fans here? No, just the, again, man, I, 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 me, I really appreciate you guys. I do, and I don't do this often enough, and, and it's something I'm going to start doing more and more and more. 
Um, I just want everybody to know how much I appreciate their questions and I appreciate them being my fans through the years. Um, it does mean a lot, man. Uh, you know, it's a crowded, crowded place with how many, you know, fighters are out there now. So, I, so I appreciate everyone for still being a fan. Thank you.